The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. Tonight, we break down the contentious amendments to the Prevention of Terrorism Act in Sri Lanka. The amendments had been discussed in the UNHRC as well with claims made of it not catering to the 21st century standards. Why are international entities critical of Sri Lanka's legislative frameworks established to fight terrorism? Have we improved the law well enough to battle the dangers of the modern world? And will this legislation be implemented to create a more comprehensive safety net against terrorism? Right, welcome to Law, Land and Liberty, where we are keeping with the promise of bringing in a legal topic that affects you and I. Um, today, something that has been filling the airways is this topic, uh, that is the economic topic that is taking place. But something that happened a few weeks back was the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Now, this was taken up by not only Sri Lankan domestic entities, but even by international entities. A lot of interest was raised uh, pertaining to this factor. So we really need to get a breakdown as to why this interest is being brought out and whether there is legitimate cause for this sort of interest to be uh, had on domestic matters within this country. And to give us that breakdown, we have with us a very special guest, President's Counsel, you are De Silva, uh, who was part of our first program as well. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. He is the former president of the Bay Association and a senior advisor, advisor to the Justice Ministry, amongst a lot of other uh, leadership roles he's doing within the justice system within our country. And we're going to get a lot of important input from Mr. President's Counsel. Before we go into the program, we give a general breakdown as to what we are going to elaborate, what we are going to give within the discussion portion. The first segment is going to be based on the key amendments to the PTA, which is, what, which is the most recent legislature that was passed. Secondly, we are going to talk a bit about the court proceedings and what exactly is the new amendments that have been made for the law enforcement aspect. Thirdly, we are going to talk a bit about the freedom of expression, which was a contentious topic. And finally, the future of this anti-terrorism legislation, which needs to be brought to the public eye. My name is Sulani. I'm a biomed student. My question is on the key amendments to the PTA. What are the key amendments to the Prevention of Terrorism Act? All right, let's go directly into the conversation. Uh, thank you again, sir, for joining us. Um, the PTA, it was a very contentious topic, and I believe even we had reached out to you to get an understanding on this. Uh, the amendments particularly had been uh, taken up within the media, taken up within multiple entities, and they gave different interpretations to it. What, as we start the conversation, what are the salient features you would say, okay, these are the key things that we really need to look at? Because the, towards the final segment, we'll look at where we can go from this point onwards. But what are the most salient features you notice here? Uh, in fact, uh, this was discussed, as you said quite correctly, in various uh, areas, various uh, forums. And uh, it was not the first time that uh, this uh, was discussed, but in uh, previously also, uh, in 2015, uh, when previous government is there, uh, foreign countries, they asked what are you going to do with this uh, draconian law. Yeah. So this was enacted in uh, 1979, uh, Act number 48. Yes. From there on, for 43 years, we were not doing anything. So do 2015 only, the European Union and the uh, Human Rights Associations, they uh, emphasized and they uh, uh, press the government uh, to do something because at that point uh, there was no terrorism. Yeah. So that is why they asked why are you all keeping this draconian law uh, in force. So on that basis they have uh, pledged uh, to amend in 2015, uh, October 2015, they pledged to amend this. But unfortunately, they put a separate uh, enactment that is called uh, a counter terrorism act. Uh, which was not the idea of the legal fraternity as well as the uh, fundamental right people because they refused that. Okay. They said, no, you can't go ahead with this. And uh, because uh, the government, uh, pay, the members, of course, they also, uh, in 2015, they said uh, it is not uh, proper to have that legislator in it. So that was there. That thereafter, they didn't do anything. 
So then only the new government, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa's government came in, and thereafter also human rights associations and the European Union, they also came and discussed with this and said that you have to do something. So to start with, yeah. we can't now, we have admitted the fact that we want a new legislative enactment to uh, combat the terrorism. Yeah. That's a fact. But at this stage, Suddenly, you can't do that. So you have to have dialogue with several entities, and then only they, we have to come to a conclusion whether what type of a, a new act we should have. Okay. So t before you do that, there were some important areas to be amended and to change, and that is why the foreign ministry has uh, discussed with uh, committee and thereafter they uh, went on went ahead with that and then finally they drafted uh, the, the cabinet gave an approval and they drafted the uh, uh, certain amendments and then they have uh, published gazette notification uh, in uh, january 27th yeah. so then thereafter it was uh, uh, before the Supreme Court, normally we have that. Within seven days, uh, we have to go to Supreme Court. And then several uh, people, they have gone to Supreme Court and they argue this matter uh, at length. And thereafter, Supreme Court has the game, the determination to the uh, speaker. Finally, uh, speaker informed the parliament and then it was debated last week. All right. Um, I think that gives us a bit like an important context as to how and why this legislature came about. And as you <coughs> mentioned, the amendments have been pushed for, from multiple entities. Now, the claims that were going around uh, President's Council, I think you're well aware of these things about, uh, as you started with, it, people try to mention that this is draconian and they don't really consider the sort of fight we have been making against terrorism within this country. But anyway, there were, there were amendments made and we went forward. Where do you see those changes taking place within this I mean, within this specific act, as in the most recent yes, one that yes. was passed a few days back? How, how do you... And uh, now, as I mentioned to you all, they thought, the, the foreign ministry as well as the people who have drafted these uh, amendments, they thought, uh, firstly, we, uh, we will do uh, the most important areas. As far as fundamental right area, uh, uh, fundamental right applications are concerned, they they came across a lot of cases where the detention orders are yeah. there. Yeah. So uh, e earlier it was 18 months, yeah. uh, the person can be taken into custody, a person can be taken into custody and kept, they can keep the person for 18 months. So they have reduced it to 12 months. Yeah. Now it, this is not a new thing in a criminal matter as a 296 a murder case also, uh, a person is being charged for that or is being taken into custody. Uh, he can be kept for 12 months. Okay. And if it is needed, it will go up to 24 months. So the twin, uh, in a terrorist matter, I think it is uh, appropriate to have uh, 12 months and not only 12 months just keeping a person there. From the day that he was arrested and then thereafter within 48 uh, hours, uh, he should be produced before the magistrate and then uh, he should be, uh, the authority should inform the magistrate that this person has been taken into custody. And their letter should be given to the magistrate and it will be submitted to the home people as well why he was taken into custody. So then thereafter, a lawyer can go and meet him and right. get necessary instruction. That is also very important. Earlier it was not there. So uh, you all can remember the Hezbollah's case yep. where the lawyers have gone to Supreme Court yep. and then asked uh, uh, the permission to go and meet uh, the, their client. So now it is, they, they don't have to go there. So it was given as a right where the government is in a position to say that a lawyer should be uh, allowed to go and meet not only the lawyer, uh, their uh, parents or their relations can visit him and then have a discussion with him. So it, he will be kept for certain purposes that to interrogate and then find out any other material with regard to terrorism. Yeah. Mind you this now, you can say a lot of things, human rights violation and everything, but this is being taken, the person is being taken into custody for what? 
for terrorism. Now, the, this law will, not, some people, the police people, they will uh, go beyond that and they will not adhere to the purpose. Yeah, yeah. That's a different matter. Yeah. That is, of course, implementing purpose. Implementing. But the fact remains that when a terrorist person is a person is being charged under terrorist law, he should be kept in a certain place to get some information. So that is very important. That is why they say 12 months is sufficient, and then uh, the facilities will be given. The magistrate can visit him and ask him, what are the problems you have? You have been tortured or not, you have been threatened or not, and harassed or not. Do those matters can be elicited from there. And if he, uh, if he sees that uh, the, uh, he should be produced before the JMO, it is his duty to do that. Right. So he, he, this, this uh, enactment, the, the new amendments, they gave the permission to go, the magistrate, to go there and find out everything from that person. And then thereafter, if there is any any uh, any uh, thing that uh, the magistrate thinks that it is important, appropriate to change the place, yeah. even that is also possible. The magistrate can inform uh, the authorities, please change this person to another place. This is not appropriate to him. So apart from that, if the magistrate is of the view he has been harassed and threatened and tortured, then he can inform the IG and thereafter it is the duty of the IG to inform the uh, AG and file cases again, immediately, file cases against the people who are concerned. Mm -hmm. So those areas have been covered and then if a person is not satisfied with the uh, arrest, then can go to Supreme Court straight away. Yeah. So that is a fundamental right. So then they can challenge the arrest and thereafter Supreme Court will decide whether it is correct or not. Apart from that, after 12 months period is lapsed, thereafter if he is in a position, if he wants to get bail, he can apply bail, uh, bail application to court of appeal. Oh, right. Then thereafter, if the case is not being heard after one year's period, after serving the indictment, then the High Court judge has the power to grant bail also. All right. uh, Mr. <coughs> um, something I want to clarify on the offset within our first segment itself is, uh, we see there are provisions within the amendments as well to hear cases on a daily basis. That's correct. Yeah. To take it up on a daily basis because now the claim when we talk about the legal system, wherever within our country the claim is, okay, look, it takes too much time. How does this amendment really fit into that claim? Are we addressing that within within the amendments? It is clearly stated in the in the amendment that uh, all cases, once the indictment is served, all cases should be heard day-to-day -day basis. That is a mandatory requirement. Now. Even uh, everywhere it is being clear, uh, clearly stated, yeah. but unfortunately we have, we need more and more judges and more and more courthouses and staff also to do that. It is very easy to write this uh, in a, a particular law, but when you are going to implement that, practically it's a bit difficult. But to avoid that, I would say now the now new law has come into operation that is pre-trial stage. That is, I suppose, is very, very important and it is the duty of the lawyers as well as the judges and the state council as well, lawyers in the sense both the defense and the prosecution and the judges also, it is the duty because they have they can easily curtail these cases when the pre-trial stage is there. Right. So that is important factor in overall concept. But as you say, ask me, it is clearly stated this these cases should be heard day to day basis. Day -to -day basis. Uh, okay, Ms. you are I think a very important uh, context that has been given to our discussion. We'll go for a very short break. We are in conversation with President's Council. You are De Silva. Stay with us. This is Law and Liberty. Hello, my name is Delini and I'm an undergraduate. My question is on court proceedings. 
How will the court proceedings and enforcement aspect in Sri Lanka be affected by the new amendments to the PTA? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Counsel U.R. De Silva. Um, so I think uh, we gave a very good uh, context to the beginning of this discussion. Uh, now the, the primary focus of this is going to be the amendments, but I believe it's difficult to speak about the amendments without d drawing relationship with the PTA itself, because that is the principal legislature that we have, pr the principal enactment as it is identified within the amendments as well. Um, the next segment that we are trying to look at is how the court proceedings are going to move forward from this point onwards. Now, uh, I believe you gave uh, some idea, the background of how it will function, where it can go to. Um, something that we would like to really clarify here is how does the appellate process would work in this instance now if an individual first of all what the the court of first instance is it going to be the high courts where where do they in fact file this how does that entire process of enforcing the ag suspect uh, comes into play if you can explain that a bit yes now when a person is arrested and uh, kept under detention and then thereafter uh, he was produced before the magistrate that is a normal procedure then with regard to bail it was not there earlier and subsequently uh, attorney general has the power uh, he had the power to come and give the consent okay. i think it was not correct to have that type of thing because attorney general cannot take haphazard decisions they have to collect all the material from the police. Yeah. So the police have to submit the IB extracts. Then only they can go and uh, find out whether there is an appropriate case or not. And then they will go and say that we are not ob objecting for bail. For that purpose, it will take some time. So because of that, then uh, they have removed that part and uh, it will take some time to get the uh, correct uh, idea with regard to a person. So, Avoid, to avoid that, they have given the power, uh, the, the legislator had given the power to court of appeal. Okay. The court of appeal, of course, I personally believe it is not proper to have that type of thing. In a, in a future, you have to give, give that facility to the court of, uh, high court, right. provincial high court. Because now a person from uh, Jaffna or Batiklo or uh, down south, they have to go to court of appeal to Colombo to file their bail application. It's very, very difficult and with the available bail application before court, uh, court of appeal, as far as the other cases are concerned, it's very, very difficult to uh, get dates and then get, move forward. So to avoid that, if you can give the power to the provincial high courts, it is the best remedy we can give them because then uh, they can go forward and do the, get their uh, people out uh, without getting prolonged. Right. And apart from that, as I told you in the, in the earlier situation, that most of the police people, they take somebody into custody and say, we are going to find out that we, he has, he, as he, uh, the, in this particular case, we want to find out whether any terrorism uh, activity is there yeah. or any terrorism connection is there. Yeah. To find out, he has to uh, be there in remand okay. under PTA. Yeah. So to avoid that, uh, uh, with the consent of the uh, Honorable Attorney General, I am thankful to the Honorable Attorney General. They have gone into this matter. They, they saw that the, uh, this uh, PTA Act was abused. Yeah. By taking various people unnecessarily to custody, they are taken into custody and they are prolonging, they are in, uh, inside the uh, remand prison without bail because of this act. Now they have given uh, necessary instruction, you can't have a person taken into custody without proper concrete evidence. Uh, under PTA. So that uh, that uh, circular uh, IG un, uh, under the supervision or under the instructions of Honorable Attorney General, the IG has uh, sent a, a circular to all police stations that is uh, September 2021. That circular has clearly stated don't take people under PTA unless and otherwise you have uh, strong material or concrete material to show that he has some scores of uh, connection with regard to uh, terrorism act. 
So that is very important at this stage because you can change the law, you can amend the law, but the fact remains whether the authorities, the people who are implementing, they are going to abuse this law or not. Exactly. So we have come across on several locations, police have violated fundamental right cases, uh, fundamental rights issues, and then they have taken these people into custody unnecessarily. You know, after some uh, time, that is after 12 months or uh, 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 one and a half years, they say we don't have any evidence to proceed further. We will charge him under normal law. So what is the remedy thereafter? Most, all people cannot go to Supreme Court and challenge these uh, cases under fundamental right cases. So this is very important and I say after two, uh, September 2021, police are bound to adhere to this particular thing and the Attorney General will not allow them to do so. If they are going to uh, arrest these type of people in a, unnecessarily, they will ask the IJ to take necessary action. President's Council, something I want to clarify, before moving forward, something I want to clarify is now you mentioned the police have a duty to find proper evidence as in something concrete in order to uh, at least make that arrest. Who makes that uh, decision whether this evidence is actually something that can be held against this? Is it the Attorney General that comes in? No, very important question you ask. Now, it is the first instance where he will be produced before the magistrate. And I say it is the duty of the magistrate. Now, be, I mean, the learned magistrates have been given the task to find out the people and go and find out the requirements and everything. But at the same time, they are bound to find out from the B report. When the police submit the B report stating PTA, uh, under PTA, no, you can't just remand a person. It is clearly stated in Supreme Court that the magistrate is not, not a person who is mechanically remand a person. Remand a, he is not there to remand a person like that. So it is the duty of the magistrate to go through the B report and find out whether any material is available. There is, you can't see beyond reason about there should be evidence. No, on the face of it, if there is evidence to show that he has done something under PTA, then of course they can uh, allow that application. Otherwise, the learned magistrate has the power to say that I am not going to remand for the sake of remanding a person. It is clearly stated to collect the evidence, you should not say, uh, keep a person in remand. Uh, I think that clarifies a lot of doubts uh, people would have had. Uh, President's Council, something I want to look into. Now the minister's role in the PTA had also been uh, taken into account. If you can give us uh, what exactly the current situation is, because that was also something that was uh, spoken about in the previous years. Yes. How, how has that changed? Now, earlier uh, there, there was this <laughs> uh, bad procedure where the minister has the power to do whatever he wants. I don't think it is proper to have that type. That is why it has been given to the magistrate to find out and see whether it is appropriate to keep that person in that particular place or not. He can change the uh, situation and then a bill is also uh, coming to power and then Attorney General's power also removed because a, a, it will take some time and uh, the Attorney General also not the judiciary is not doing the judiciary act. So it is up to court to decide about the, those things. And now the minister uh, doesn't have that power and then the, the important point would be adversary, adversary board. Adversary board. Adversary board is very, very important. It was there earlier, but it was not uh, really uh, functioning. And now uh, this government only uh, appointed uh, Justice uh, Asoka de Silva, former uh, Chief Justice, to this particular uh, advisory board. And after going through the reports available, uh, the, this particular committee has released 81 people. Okay. 81 people who were there in languishing in custody and it is a very good move where any person can uh, apply or send a letter to the advisory board and it is very easy to go and lodge the complaint also. They can go there and write everything in their piece of paper and put it to a box and then immediately it will be attended. 
and thereafter this advisory board uh, will go into details and call all uh, necessary uh, available evidence and find out whether it is appropriate or not. Thereafter they will uh, take a decision and then uh, finally uh, they will uh, solve the problems. Yes. So on that basis as I told you 81 people have been released uh, from the custody. Right. Uh, uh, President's Council, something I want to, because this has not been explained properly to the people, this specific uh, point of the advisory board, if you, now this was identified in the previous, uh, as in the initial act as well, but uh, I think even the international entities didn't really properly have some time to like really grasp what this concept is. If I think you did touch on this, but if you could explain further the role that the advisory board plays, how that uh, appellate pro process would work, how can you can make a claim to the advisory board, and what does it act like another court? How exactly do you explain? Uh, this, is, no, this is not like a court, but in between. Yeah. Uh, the Attorney General has all cases are there with him and a lot of pro, uh, areas to cover. Yeah. So to avoid that uh, uh, prolonging uh, situation, they, the, the legislature has given power to the particular advisory board. This was there earlier, I can remember when we were handling these matters in 89 also, it was functioning very well. Justice Jayalat was doing that and he did a great job and helping a lot of people to uh, release, to get their release. Yeah. So they, they, because of that, I think this is also very important where now they have appointed not a s s yeah. small, normal person, no, but, but judge, he, yeah. he former Chief Justice of this country. And Chief Justice, uh, former Chief Justice Asokari Silva, Justice Asokari Silva uh, knows very well yeah. uh, how these uh, function uh, these uh, B reports and the police uh, evidence and all these things and the, he is not going to uh, determine the case on the available evidence on the face of it if there is something important then they will take a decision and then they will inform the authorities that he should be released okay. they can inform the attorney general as well but they they have the power to take decisions not to uh, go into the matter and finally determine it but if there is no evidence there is no purpose of keeping the police say that they want to investigate and investigate they will give some time and see whether the evidence is coming up or not, then thereafter they will take a decision. Very quickly, uh, Mr. President's Counsel, if I can clarify, so it's the magistrate, and even if the magistrate says, okay, we, we can keep this individual in custody, the advisory uh, board can make a decision above that, or how does that? Yes, yes. advisory board can uh, take a decision and inform the magistrate, right. uh, please consider this factor, and uh, now, up to now, they have not considered these things, and they, they, they can believe this release, immediate. right. Okay, I think a very important segment that we passed there. We'll take a very short break. You're with Lawline and Liberty. Stay with us. Hello, I am Abdul Jasmin, an undergraduate at the University of Colombo. My question is regarding the freedom of expression. I want to know about how has the freedom of expression been affected by the PT? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Counsel U.R. De Silva, who is a former president of the Bar Association and senior advisor to the Justice Ministry. Thank you so much, sir, again for joining us to we'll give a very important breakdown these days. Um, the next segment we are going to really focus on is the freedom of expression. Now this is a claim that has been spread around for quite some time and uh, main multiple entities try to give their own various interpretations of this. How, I think you can make references to the initial PTA as well, how has the PTA affected, if, if, it, if it has affected the freedom of expression and how has the amendments made any progress in that regard also? As I informed you earlier also, uh, now, when we are going to implement yeah. the clauses in that PTO or any other act, the implementing body and all the authorities, they, uh, they are going to uh, do injustice. So, they, they, are, they are not going to do it properly and if they are going to abuse that particular areas, then it will be 
violation of fundamental right. So in our country, uh, our present constitution gave a special area that is with regard to fundamental rights. From 10, clause 10 to 15, 14, uh, it is clearly stated what are the fundamental rights yeah. and what are, what are the constitutionally they have accepted the rights of a person. Mm -hmm. So then we have all the rights mentioned in that particular uh, constitution, our constitution. Then there, 15 says you can't have in haphazardly, you can't uh, do whatever you want. There, within the frame of some uh, area, you can uh, have enjoy your fundamental right. right. right? So you can abuse that also. So to, uh, that is clearly stated in that. Okay. So if, we, if somebody is violating, if the authorities are violating somebody's fundamental rights, now there is a special courthouse, right. that is the Supreme Court, where you can go and file the, your fundamental right application and then challenge uh, the uh, arrest or any other area where it has been violated. Okay. So my personal view is now it is a lot of cases are coming up in Supreme Court with regard to this fundamental right area. So as far as these uh, cases are concerned, I personally believe that is also should not have the uh, I mean keep in there in future also. It should be given back to uh, the High Court uh, in future because then only more more people whether they have money or not, they can go to court. court and then get their relief done. So uh, the people, will, the legislator will decide on, the government will decide on that later. Anyhow, it will be discussed there in uh, fundamental rights cases will be discussed in most of the forums and they will be given the opportunity, the government will be given the opportunity to adjust their uh, method and then change the law accordingly. All right. Uh, uh, President's <coughs> Council, something that uh, we, we witness when we look at the PTA is the references made to uh, the acts of terrorism can take multiple forms and one of those forms would be publications and all of them. That is really recognized within the PTA. Uh, does the amendments to the PTA really uh, look into that? Are there amendments, specific amendments made in those regards? Because as, as you mentioned before, another contentious aspect of uh, the PTA in the past was arrests made in relation to publications. How has that changed? And if, if that has changed, what kind of, uh, let's say, a, a sort of more advanced response has been given from this legislature to protect both uh, innocent and you know, uh, both parties? How has the publication aspect been dealt with? Yeah. I think uh, we have to take a serious uh, note of it and then change the law accordingly because now we can't see the terrorism is coming up in straightaway form where they have adopted various methods. Yeah. They use electronic media exactly. and then uh, uh, our culture is different now. Yeah. So th for that purpose, we have to address ourselves with regard to those areas as well. Now they have changed according to uh, the present situation. The terrorists also, they are taking different views. Mm -hmm. Now they are not straight away come and attack these things. They, how they are preparing themselves for the future, uh, any future attacks. So that is also very important. That is why the government has decided to have a separate law for that. So at that point, this PTA Act will be abolished. Right. Uh, till such time, we have to have something. Otherwise, now we know what happened when we ignored everything and uh, we were not doing any of the alarms. So that is why uh, the earlier uh, situation uh, arose. Yeah. So to avoid that, uh, we have to take stern action after discussing uh, with the authorities, not only the authorities, but we have to get some ideas from foreign countries. Yeah. Foreign laws will be uh, should be addressed, mm -hmm. and then only we can uh, we can change the law. That is why uh, the honourable minister, that is uh, Professor G L P, as well as our minister uh, Ali Sabri, uh, President Council, he clearly stated, please give us some material or your ideas, your views for us to have a comprehensive uh, terrorist act 
Right. So that is uh, very important. I mean, we can't just haphazardly have a uh, uh, act like that for the sake of uh, abolishing this. You, if you can have a in another for, a, for another way of having a terrorism act is not the issue here. We want to have a clear cut uh, terrorism anti terrorism act where we have to go into details because without violating the fundamental rights. Fundamental rights is very important. We have recognized that and we can't violate also whether the people who are uh, implementing it, uh, they are violating or not is a different matter. On the face of it, you can't do that. So to avoid that, you have to have a lot of dialogue yeah. and get more material and more uh, details uh, around the country and have a comprehensive anti-terrorism act. Right. Uh, Mr. De Silva, something that we we witnessed is the, the prohibition of publications. Now I move back to that topic on uh, within the PTA. Uh, we see that certain competent authorities have been established to take permission prior to making any publications. Now, in terms of the enforcement aspect of this, do you believe, now I'm not bleeding into the last segment where we'll talk about where we need to improve on, but in terms of enforcing the publication aspect, how does that actually work, uh, President's Council? Because I think people are not aware if there is a claim of a certain publication, in fact, violating the PTA. It is, a, is there some form of relief that is given there? Is there, uh, is there a stop from uh, publications being done in the future? How does that exactly work? Where, which authority has the power there? The people have the right to express their views. That is perfectly correct and uh, it should be adhered to. But now uh, there is a special unit established in the police department where they monitor those areas. And uh, my personal view is without going into details immediately or without arresting that person immediately and uh, keep that person under PTA, if they are in a position to get some uh, material and then go and meet the Honorable Attorney General and get advice. This is very good and otherwise it will be a problem for future endeavors because people will feel that we can't express our views. Yeah. At the same time, people think we can do whatever, we can express whatever things uh, we want, uh, whether it is violating oh, no. the present situation of the country, violating the uh, others fundamental rights, yes. of course we have to do that, see it. And if you are going without any material, if you just put a post and say, uh, I thought this is appropriate and I put, no, you can't do that. Yes. If you are going public media and uh, if you Facebook and then uh, Twitter uh, the things and then all the, these Instagram. are public. Yeah. So Instagram, so then it is important to find out whether I am doing a correct thing. If I have material, whether it is not good for the government, it is not uh, material here. You can do that. Yeah. If you, 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 are, you have been asked to come and give a statement, you go and put all the material. Yeah. Now, most of the cases we found that they, when they were asked to come to the police, they say, ah, this is violating. We are, we are being asked to come to give. Every, every person is, uh, ready to, should be ready to go there and give a statement if and when the police is asking to come and give a, a statement. See, it is not a thing that you are going to arrest that person. If you are asked to come and give a statement why you made this uh, statement or express your view, it is your duty to go and put all your material. You can't just go there and say, I saw somewhere and I, uh, in my Facebook or in my other uh, accounts I put forward. No, you can't do that. It is violating your uh, fundamental rights also and violating the others' uh, fundamental rights. So you have to be very careful. I always say, if you have material with you, please expose yeah. all the corruptions and all the unnecessary things that are being done by the government. Yeah. That is up to you. Yeah. And it is your duty as well. Yeah. So if you don't have that, for the sake of getting publicity and getting satisfaction for yourself, you must not do that. 
a very important segment that we passed there. We'll take a very short break. You're watching Law Line and Liberty State. Himashi and I am a teacher. My question is on the future of terrorism legislature. What are the core areas of evolution that are required when fighting terrorism using the law in the future? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Council, you are De Silva. Uh, in our last segment, something that we want to really look into is uh, given that I think from the onset you mentioned the PTA will be replaced at one point with some other form of legislature that looks into modern times. Now, it's a, it's a very favorable aspect that we see that we are making amendments and this has also been recognized by international community. What is our next step from this point onwards, uh, President's Council, because you work with the government, you work with the legislative process very closely and for so quite some time. Where do we go from this instance onwards? Do you believe that this entire uh, legislative framework should be stepped out and a new thing should come into place or other things that we can work on, build on when it comes to this legislation? Oh, it is important to build uh, more things and uh, remove unnecessary and unwanted things uh, from the, from the earlier act. Yeah. And uh, now in, in this particular act also, the certain areas uh, are there where you can easily implement it and then get a maximum benefit. So, for example, uh, now the magistrate can record a statement. Okay. So, most of the cases, police are not doing that. Okay. They say it is uh, important to have a Smith's confession. So, from 83, we were doing these uh, cases, and 89, I was very much involved uh, in these uh, PTA matters, where the uh, JVP uh, people were taken into custody unnecessarily and harassed and tortured and they were uh, asked to sign the statements and most of the uh, statements given to uh, the police, normal police person will be take same uh, uh, statement will be there in the ASP state, word to word right. and only the signature is there. So most of the cases were failed. The, uh, court, uh, the high courts, they refuse to accept uh, the uh, confession. So I say uh, this is very important area we should address. So if we are going to keep that ASP's confession intact, that is wrong. I think it is not proper. So if the magistrates are being given the duty to record, then he is a judicial person. He has a judicial mind. And when the person is being uh, produced before the magistrate, he will have a dialogue with him and he will give time to think over. And thereafter, if it is necessary, he should be remanded and then uh, ask them to bring him for some time. And then certainly he has the authority to ask, still you are in a position, you are willing to give a statement. If he says yes, then record the statement. Okay. So that is, it is there clearly in section 8. But I don't think police are... Uh, happy to have that. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, another very important thing is Section 11, where restrictions of movement. Okay. Where they, we say that, that all people should not be kept in remand. Or the under uh, PTA, they, are, they were uh, there, where people don't know where he is there. So after remanding only, we can find out where the place where he is there. Now, anyhow, without uh, giving, uh, sending that person to remand, hardcore people can be there, that's a different matter. But in other cases where you can say you will be there at your home with your relatives, yeah. home people, and you, your, your uh, res uh, movements are restricted, and it will be monitored by the police yeah. of that area. So it's, it's local police can be monitored yeah. and he can report to police uh, in uh, various uh, periodical people, uh, that, time. That provision is available. In available and it should be given more power yeah. and it, it very easily implemented. And uh, if you do that, 
uh, it is a good move where the government can say we have not restricted their movements and we are uh, though they, we have restricted they can be there in their home no. and then if the investigations are going on they can do that yeah. and then thereafter if it is uh, if it is material available with the police then they can inform the honorable attorney general the cases will be filed after that yeah. so uh, that matter should be adhered to and uh, it should be there in the new uh, new law also when we are going to have the uh, new K, uh, anti terrorism act right. so uh, that is those areas should be there and then i said the advisory board thing also very important that shows that we have refined everything and it is more and more fundamental areas being covered yeah. so they they can't say we, uh, it is being uh, violated and mind you you can't expect everything uh, to be done in a normal way now the, I saw the uh, in the parliament they say within 24 hours you have to do everything. So that cannot be done. This is terrorism. The whether the people, the police are going to take the person unnecessarily is a different matter. So you can't say that because of that you have to have a uh, you have to uh, abolish the PTA. So all people are saying, uh, remove the uh, PTA Act. No, you can't do that haphazardly because we should be concentrating on uh, terrorism. So at the moment, worldwide, it has been covered and it has been identified in British Parliament. They have passed a PTA Act in 2005 and then uh, Canada also, 2015. This anti-terrorism act is there. The most of the countries, they have accepted the fact that we should have separate law because do you know why most of the people they are not willing to come and give uh, evidence eyewitnesses are not available so they, we have to find out other methods not that uh, confession only yeah. the electronic evidence are there that is why they are having the uh, this uh, uh, our phones, yeah. uh, mobile phones, then you can find out where he was doing and what the movements are can be checked yeah. from the phone you are using. So that is those uh, areas are available and further uh, electronic evidence can be accepted and then CCTV camera uh, evidence is very important and DNA also very important. Those areas should be adhered and then uh, address and then thereafter if it is important and how are we going to implement that and how are we going to take uh, these things into our law is very important and we should uh, do uh, that's why I said more comprehensive act with regard to this. Uh, so you are, uh, before we end the program something I want to give, take your understanding is I think you really suggested to us that the enforcement aspect should be overlooked. The enforcement part is like a big, big area within this. But as you, I think you touched on this aspect, but to get a clearer understanding, people make, as in uh, the examples you brought out really pushes this point forward because Western countries are now taking an our interest in, you know, having stricter legislation against terrorism. In 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 this in this context, uh, President's Council, why the P, why is the PTA important today over any other time period? Because the criminal law is available, and how does the PTA or ter anti-terrorism legislature really move away or has another sort of standing in our in our legal system? Because that is some an aspect that a lot of people have really not understood as of now. Because terrorists the, the 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 impact a terrorist could do to a population is quite different to what a criminal could do and there that dichotomy starts building up how do you how do you explain that situation your point had been considered in hisbullah's case very recently that is uh, cap capn 10 of 22 where the uh, the court of appeal Justice uh, Iddhavella yeah. has gone into that matter and he has stated men and institutions remain free only when freedom is founded upon respect of the rule of law and that grievances should be redressed by constitutional methods. So constitutional method is you have to have a proper clear uh, act where you can uh, give relief to normal people. Under normal uh, law, that is criminal law, as you said, uh, there are evidence available 
and people uh, come give and give you evidence for that apart from the other uh, circumstantial evidence or electronic evidence there are more areas where you can prove a case yeah. but here of course it's so complicated yes. they do it in a way that they have gone more than what the police expect that is why i say the attitude should be changed of the police and they should be given more training and more uh, more instruments to find out those things uh, more things that are there that should be there to monitor the people before you arrest a person you just go and arrest a person and keep that person and you try to extract from him that is not the correct way of investigating you monitor it carefully and at the correct point you take him into custody and that person cannot say anything yeah because a lot of material will be there for him to answer yeah. then they will automatically he will come out with the uh, exact facts without harassing him yeah. so that is the way we should uh, address these things and a lot of investigation part should be addressed in the Uh, in future and i say as i quite uh, earlier pointed out the attitudes of the police should be changed immediately if they think that by taking him uh, taking a person into custody and we can do uh, whatever we want and if there is a problem we can fill the uh, that problem by putting somebody else is not the good thing right. not a good thing so you you are bound to adhere to those fundamental right areas right. you can just pers- get, uh, arrest a person for the sake of arresting and keep them person in remand that because uh, the legislature has given power to have 12 months period no that is not correct so if you have the material you do it and then finally you will do a good service to the country right I think a very important point that has been made there and a very important segment that we passed the uh, president's council you are disabled thank you so much sir, for joining us uh, on on this very pertinent subject is a former president of the bar association and a senior advisor to the justice ministry i believe a lot of uh, issues had been clarified and thank you once again for joining us on this thank program. you very much for inviting me for this thank segment thank you. <laughs> thank you all right Terrorism is not a unique threat to the 21st century but it has unfortunately taken different forms which requires more critical and up to date forms of legislation to fight it. The former president of France Jacques Chirac shared the following thoughts on terrorism. Terrorism has become the systemic weapon of a war that knows no borders or seldom has a face. This captures the volatile and dangerous evolution of terrorism that Sri Lanka should pay a lot of attention to. That is all from us here at Law Land and Liberty. If you had missed today's program, you can watch the entire episode on our YouTube channel youtube.com other than in English. Join us again next week as we break down a contemporary legal topic. I am Danish Tanwasam. Have a great day.